Hey there! Welcome to episode 6 of the Artist in Me is Dead podcast. I'm your host, Rhonda Willers. This episode features a conversation with Teresa Schneeweiss. Teresa is a multimedia artist and arts educator located in Virginia. Her connection and conversations with her creativity started at a very early age. You'll hear about her early mentors, an artist community, and how community remains an important part of keeping her creativity full of vitality. As we are in real time emerging from winter in the upper Midwest, Teresa's expression that her creativity is currently hibernating seems very fitting to share as this week's episode. Please enjoy this conversation with Teresa Schneeweiss. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for being here today. Hi. <laughs> excited to talk with you. I'm excited. <laughs> so where I want to start is I want, would like you to share with us what your, some of your formal background in art has been. Where have you kind of learned how to do some of the things you know how to do? Um, well, so I've been doing art from like super young age. Like I was really uh, interested in it as well. Like my, okay, I'm going to go way back. So my mom tells me I was like a year and a half. And so like, I could just barely talk. And I was like learning how to, you know, pick up pencils and stuff. And, and I just started drawing and I could barely even say what I drew. So that's, that's when I started. And then I just like kept going and had an interest in that. And like my parents, didn't have a ton of money but they bought us like line notebooks and pencils and so that's what we did a lot of um me and my sisters I say when I mean we a lot of our drawings and so we just have tons of notebooks full of drawings and then as I got older my like when I like middle school high school my mom paid for like community classes hmm. uh, because I didn't think the art in school was enough <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like I want to take more and so she paid for community classes like so I did like jewelry making watercolor figure drawing I think ceramics one time so just a bunch of different random and but I was in classes with like 60 year olds I was, <laughs> I was like 13 years old making friends with like Linda and Betty and <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> It was so fun. Do you have memories? I'm going to interrupt for a minute, but do you have memories about what those other people in the class were like and why they were taking classes? Like, did they talk about that with you as a young person or did you have in, like interactions with them? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so sweet. There was one lady, actually I think her name was Jean. She did a lot of cardinals. She painted a lot of cardinals in our watercolor class, but she told me that she was taking the class because she was always interested in art and throughout her life she just didn't ever have a lot of time for it mm. so now that she's retired and she takes classes and that mm. was like the story with almost all of them I feel mm. just never taking the time when they're younger to do it or feeling like they, they can't do it mm. like, because they're working and have families and kids and mm -hmm. so and I was just like I guess hearing that as a kid though I was like well that's ridiculous <laughs> like <laughs> what do you mean you just, don't have time what do you mean you don't have time like your kids take a nap at some point right <laughs> so like not realizing all that goes into like being a mom and taking care of a house and whatever but so I was like oh, okay all right that makes sense you have time when you're retired but then I just thought that all retired people painted birds so, <laughs> and I was like oh that's what I gotta look into. <laughs> not saying it's a bad thing birds are great but like I never had an interest in drawing birds so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I have to look forward to <laughs> painting birds in my retirement <laughs> or grandkids birds or grandkids <laughs> I shouldn't, which is fine. That's fine. My aunt right. does that. She paints her grandkids and birds, but like, yeah, whatever you like. But 
Oh. As a 13-year-old kid, I was like, that is not exciting. <laughs> Do you recall how you responded to them when they would share that? Because like in your head, you're sharing your dialogue with us today. Like that was not exciting. But uh, at the time, did you just kind of nod, do you think? Or Yeah, I think I would, well, I was more, a little more chatty. So I would, I'm guessing my response is probably like, oh, well, it's nice you have this class now or, you know, something yeah. supportive. And I mean, their birds were great, like better than what I could do. So, <laughs> so I was like, oh, dang. And I was shocked, though, that the skill that some of these women had, I say women only because it was mostly women that took it mm -hmm. um, I don't remember a guy being there but so most of these women that were in the classes they uh they're pretty good and I feel like if they would have been doing art for a longer period of time they could have built that skill mm -hmm. and they would have been even better mm -hmm. but just because they never you know took the time to do it until they're in their like 60s or 70s mm -hmm. some were even in their almost 80s wow yeah, they were they were good at it, and they would enter like little community art sh art shows or whatever, like little gallery openings we'd have, and mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh yeah, there's Jean's birds. Oh, <laughs> and then so she would be standing over there and be like, Jean, like look at. Oh, so were they like your first introduction to artists in a way, or did you know artists before them? Oh. Um Oh my gosh. I'm going to cry. Oh, <laughs> um, I think so. Hmm. Like, um, I mean, the only other artists I knew were like my art teachers mm -hmm. in school. Yeah. Um, which there's a, another art teacher I had like really briefly in elementary school that I like as a kindergartner mm. always remember, but I know, to me, she was like an actual artist, like yeah. where all, some of the other teachers were just like filling in mm -hmm. and we did like more crafty things. Yeah, I think those older ladies were like the actual like some of the first artists I met that were just like right to me. They were just regular people. Yeah. That, I don't know, like me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they weren't a teacher. They weren't. Mm -hmm. um, they just did art at home. So. Mm -hmm. I probably related, I probably related to that a lot then. Cause I was like, Oh, like you don't like, I just do art at home too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And just even like when you were describing seeing Jean with her birds at the exhibition and thinking yeah. about like, you see, you got to see an exhibition and you knew the person who made the work and yes. how that's impactful too, versus when we go to museums or galleries, we can see work that we don't know the real person. So they're not entirely fully human to us because we don't know them. Mm -hmm. And when you see, when you see an artist as being fully human and, and see them in your life, how that makes it so much more real and, and even possible. I'm really thinking about that lately of like how something becomes a possible thought to us as oh. something we could do. And that like, even those yeah. ladies, painting their birds oh my god well and I okay so you saying that I had never even thought of that before mm. but yeah so which is what when you said that I was like oh my god I think so I think those <laughs> ladies were like they were it yeah <laughs> like Barbara and Jean and you know yeah. with their sweaters and with like a chickadee in the snow on their sweater <laughs> you know like and the doily like rim yeah on the sweater yeah and we would show up you know, like every, like once a week and be like, oh, how was your week? And mm -hmm. <laughs> hanging out with retired ladies <laughs> after school. <laughs> after school. <laughs> Did your sisters take these classes with you too? Or was it just you? Just, this was something no, just it, for you. It was just me. Um, I, so like I have, well, you know this, but I have two younger sisters. Mm -hmm. We all mostly me and the middle sister Maria, she, we were very artistic as kids and we drew a lot. And I think maybe just because I was older and was doing it for a longer period of time, I maybe got more attention because of it, mm -hmm. which I feel horrible because Maria is just as talented, mm -hmm. but she didn't stick with art. She kind of dabbled in writing and she's really good at like, um, she's fantastic with books and writing and editing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So Hannah tried um and she would like trace over our artwork like 
because mm-hmm. that's when we started getting like sketchbooks when I was a little bit older and she would trace over like from the page before and like try to draw mm. um, just because me and Marie both did so she figured she also had to or should be able to do it and I think if she did practice more or had the interest in it she could also be great mm-hmm. uh-huh. but you know everybody has their own interests and whatnot and pulls them in different directions so yeah so they didn't take the classes with me because of that because I was just so I don't want to say the word obsessed but I was very much into art Mm -hmm. and I didn't ever break away from it so my parents did that for me so Mm -hmm. well and I can imagine because of something you said early too like you were probably also asking for more in terms yeah. of wanting it. And, and that's different too. Like when your child comes to you and asks you, like, I want to do this. I want, like, there's a, a pull as a parent that you try to figure out how to provide them those opportunities to explore mm-hmm. that. So in high school, you were taking art classes and everything at school as well, but were you, and then you continued to take those community classes because it wasn't enough. It wasn't mm-hmm. enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then tell us about the decision to what you did next with um, pursuing your art in college. Oh, I didn't even get that far. I know um, there's so yeah. much, there's so much goodness. <laughs> That's no worries. We can take uh, our time. <laughs> so then, okay. So then through, let's see, I still did those classes, like the community classes up through middle school, high school. And then I decided I was going to go to school for go to college for art. Some of my relatives were like, you should go because you don't want to waste your talent and you don't want to waste it. And uh, which I feel like some days I am absolutely wasting it. But <laughs> oh, we have to talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, well, yeah, like it makes sense. I have to go to school for art. Like what else? I have no other strong interest or pull towards anything. Mm-hmm. So I did that. I went for five years, actually. Mm-hmm. I think the I can't remember if I went five or five and a half. I don't know. I really like school. <laughs> it took me five so, for undergrad. Okay. So yeah, I just want, and I, I liked, uh, I just like being in the studio. And then I f- actually found what I like to do in ceramics. Like I knew I wanted to be in ceramics, but I actually found what I liked doing like way at the end. Mm. Like not mm. even the whole time I was in taking clay classes I was just like playing around like the whole time, like every critique, I wasn't like strongly pulled towards any idea. Mm. Um, And then right before my senior show, I was like, I know what I'm going to (laughs) do. What allowed you to stay in that? I think a lot of times students express that it's really hard to just sort of play and not become maybe deeply attached to ideas that they have for projects even. So what do you think allowed you to play with anything and not be too attached to what you made? Like, was there a mindset? Did someone say something to you to help? Or is it just a mindset that you naturally have? Could you talk us through that part of Um, your experience? Yeah, I, the mindset I have with art, I don't know if a lot of people have it or not, but I just feel like anything I make, I can do again. So I'm not attached to any one idea. I'm like, I can always come back to it Mm. if I wanted to, or like, like even in terms of something would break, I'd be like, Oh, well, it's not a big deal. I can just make it again. If I wanted to, Mm -hmm. Uh, I usually don't want to, but, (laughs) 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 but, uh, but like when it comes to ideas like that, like when I say, like, I was just like, when I say I was playing, I was figuring things out, but in a very drawn out way, I feel, because mm-hmm. I feel like everybody around me had very clear ideas for critiques and like meaning behind it. When you had to talk about your work, because you had more of a playful mindset to the way you, and, and maybe more like maybe playful isn't even as accurate. It's more of an exploratory mindset, like where you were just kind of digging in the work, trying to learn from it. You mm-hmm. were just trying to figure things out and it, it never came, like maybe there wasn't always a resolution or a clear thought towards the end of it. So for you and your work, do you think that talking about it 
Like, what do you think about talking about your own work at that stage in your development? Like, was it hard to talk about the work? Was it easy to talk? Like, what did you want to share about the work at that time? Or what did you know about your own work at that time? It was insanely hard to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Super hard. I mean, I still have a hard time talking about my art Mm because I feel like I haven't fully figured it out. Mm -hmm. Um, But at that stage, it was so hard to talk about it. And I feel like I would just like stumble my way through it. And I'm trying to say this in a clear way. Like it's easy to understand. I, I felt bad trying to describe my artwork, knowing that it wasn't it. Like it mm. wasn't, it, it wasn't where it should be. And it wasn't the thing I necessarily wanted or knew what I could be doing. Mm-hmm. But, oh gosh. I'm just really thinking into this. Yeah, so, no, it's great. I feel like it was, like I said, it was really hard to talk about it. And I feel like what I said was just to get by to appease, you know, your classmates or whatever, or, and not even saying I wasn't disclosing anything about my art. I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. And, and I also think it wasn't good enough to mm-hmm. say anything great about it. That's really because I wasn't pr- I wasn't proud of it um but I didn't know what I had to do to get to make art that I was proud of mm. it's it also, sense. yeah it totally does and it's making me reflect too like as an educator how do we make space for someone to make work and be able to say you know what this is the work I'm making right now and I don't really know what it's about I haven't figured it out like I I see these things in what I'm doing but yeah. I don't know what else is there? And I don't, I think that's maybe something like I missed as a teacher, being able to give my students is the space to say, I don't know what this is yet. Yeah. And yet it's so normal to experience it. I would have loved that. I I feel like (laughs) if a a teacher would have been like, yeah, it's okay. I would have been like, thank God, because (laughs) I've been sitting here being like, I'm going to make some, some hand built, vases I'm gonna carve into it I just know I like carving that's it (laughs) like uh, I just know I like carving images and you want me to expand about like storytelling I don't even know what the story is like Mm. I just had these like images appear in my brain and I was like that's it carve it and then I had to talk about it and I was like I did this (laughs) I carved this in this vase and I don't like making vases but I like carving like, I can't just say that, <laughs> you know, I, you know, you like talk about the depth of it and whatever. And I was like, there is no depth to it because I'm not, I, I don't really love what I'm doing mm-hmm. in it or with the project or, and when it, and then when it comes to school, I feel like I was just doing it, like I said, to get it done mm-hmm. and for a grade where like now I definitely think I do less art. <laughs> now Mm -hmm. but I think more about it probably or Mm. reflect on it a little more but why don't you tell us what I don't want to do two things first let's talk about um, childhood art before we move on from kind of this preliminary area of our conversation but can you tell us about I mean, you shared your middle school art experience, but, and the notebooks and things with your sisters, but are are there any other earliest art memories or creative experiences that you can tell us about that you remember? Like any, is there any piece that you made or a drawing that you made that really you recall with great detail from your early childhood? (laughs) So, (laughs) um, I do. <laughs> Excuse me. I do. Um, so when I mentioned that uh, artist, that art teacher that I briefly had as a kindergartner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to a, a small private school and we maybe had like 13 kids in our class. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where they hired this art teacher or she was just a, a temp or whatever. But I, she had this crazy... I remember she had like crazy black dark hair and it was kind of like frizzy and it stuck out and she was a little bit older but like and she wore like all black sometimes and like I don't even remember her name we were in art class and she brought out charcoal 
Mm. And I was like, what is this? Like, I had no idea what charcoal was. And we got a piece of paper, like, pretty big piece of paper for a kindergartner. That looks like a 24, like a 24 by 18 or 24 by 22, like decent size. Yes. A piece of like, yeah, big start. Thank you for clarifying. I, yeah, no problem. (laughs) (laughs) I'm watching your arms and I'm like, I think it's about like this. this (laughs) And she, and the project, so she gave us some charcoal and she says, draw us, draw a picture of yourself. Whoa. A picture of it as a kindergarten. Oh, which I know they do that now. And I see them at fairs and stuff like little self portraits, but it was charcoal. Yeah. And so, and so like, so I had this piece of charcoal or a couple pieces and I was like, this is amazing because this is real artist stuff. Like this isn't, this isn't like lined notebook paper and a pencil, like a Ticonderoga. <laughs> like this is real art supplies and like, I have to do a good job. And so I did. And at the time I was obsessed with ballet Mm. because I took ballet as a little kid, realized like it, the dancing wasn't for me, but I still enjoyed like watching it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I drew myself as a ballerina Mm. out of charcoal on this big, and I, from like top to bottom, I did a picture of myself, like, I don't know if I was standing on one foot or something. I just remember, but I remember drawing it and I was like, this is so amazing. I was like, oh. this is the most awesome thing I've ever done because I was using, like like I said, artist tools. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was just really proud of that piece I did. I don't even know if, like, my mom still has it. I'm sure she does somewhere because she keeps mm-hmm. everything. But I always think about that all the time. And even though today I don't like charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about charcoal lately and how messy it is. And I'm like... It- can I do it? I'm like, maybe outside the summer. I don't know. <laughs> and I see artists that do it and I'm like, that's gorgeous. Yeah. And then I pick it up and I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but as a kindergarten, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. So that was the only time I've liked charcoal mm. was as a six year old, but I thought it was great. Well, and you reminded me of something, my friend Kinji, who is an, um, a fabulous sculptor, you know, Kinji too, yeah. I think. And I remember when my children were small and drawing, and I think I had shared some drawings with him or something. And he said, whenever you can give them the really nice paper, they will love it. And they deserve nice paper. Oh. And so you sharing your story just reminded me of that. And that is why like they get nice, pa- I might give them the paper, like nicer drawing paper, but it has a bend in it on the corner yeah. and then I can't use it for what I'm working on, but I give it to them now because of that. And then that way they have the nice paper to work on too. So like your story just affirms, it affirms that. And people use this in all sorts of ways, this belief of like, if you provide people with nice things, they will feel the import, they will feel important and they will feel special and they will respond with that because it, it tells them they are of, they are of value. And how important that is to communicate that to people. Oh my gosh. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. That totally made a difference though in my six-year-old brain. Yeah. Um, I feel like a real artist using charcoal. Yeah. (laughs) Oh man. Oh, okay. So that's a beautiful segue. When you say the word artist, do you claim the title of artist? We've been, I've been talking about this with different guests. Do you, like if someone says, hi, Teresa, what do you do? Or who, what do you do in your life? What do you tell people? So I, if they asked me what I do, I probably would say my job first, unfortunately, as much as I hate to admit that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do call myself an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I feel like a lot of people do. And I don't know... I just don't want, I don't, I don't know how to say it. I, f- I would feel like I'm not good enough to say that I am an artist. I know that's not true, but it took me a long time. Like as of a couple of years ago, I was like 29 or something mm-hmm. when I was like selling work online and people were d- getting like commissions from me and stuff. And I was like, Oh, I kind of am doing it. Not as big of scale as like other people do but I was like I guess I am an artist you know I went to school for it so yeah what does what what does 
what does it mean to be an artist to you? Like if I, if, could you describe what an artist is? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, make things. Mm -hmm. I don't really know if there's any more of like a, like a pin down, I don't know, description, create things. So an artist is someone who creates and make things. Yeah. But that was a hard title for you to take for yourself. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so simply. <laughs> or say about myself, but it, and it's, and it's, uh, I don't like, I don't want to sound mean. Can, can you, can I use an adult language on this? Or no? Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to sound like a straight up bitch, but mm -hmm. like, like I've met some people that are like, oh, I'm an artist too. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. Like, like, what do you do? And then like, and I don't want to, I don't want to seem judgy, but like, then they'll pull out just like photos they take on their iPhone that are like regular photos. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, did you draw this or is this paint? And they're like, oh, I take photos on my phone. I'm like, mm. oh, okay. Okay. It's such a big okay. spec. It's a big spectrum of what and what, how, well, it's, it, I think there's a layered thing to what you're expressing. It's a huge spectrum of what art, what artists create. So there's yeah. like a big range of like, somebody's taking photographs on their phone and feeling the connection to their artistic side through that practice to people working towards massive bodies of work that are like organized around a cohesive theme or deeply and there, researched. Yeah. And there's all those things. And, and then also when it's a word or an identity that is hard to hard for someone to say like, yes, own it. Like I'm an artist and then someone else owns it so easily that can set up a weird that. thing inside of ourselves. Like, oh, that, that person yeah. could say they were an artist so easily and I'm struggling with it. And I know that I can create this work that in a way is considered more art artistic or more sophisticated. Yeah by yes. the, by the art field, how are we the same? That's exactly what I'm getting at where I'm like, okay. I was like, how does, how do they just like so easily say that? And I'm over here, like, mm -hmm. like I can't say mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. <laughs> or like own it or whatever. Yeah. And that, but, but and then it's so funny. Cause you're just, you're, definition is someone who makes something or creates something well yeah they are an artist yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to move to one one back one thing I forgot to ask you to tell us a little more about when you were in undergrad what were your areas of focus for your study um like ceramics or painting or like is that what yeah. you're meaning yeah. yeah okay so I uh focused in well okay let me see back up when I started school I was like I'm just gonna do like broad area art or whatever like just take all the classes because I like it all and but I really did like drawing and painting because that's what I did a lot growing up I drew a lot so but they didn't have drawing so I was like painting okay I'll do painting mm -hmm. couldn't get in the class it was like yeah. really hard to get into and I was like well now what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I did do some ceramic. I took one ceramic class in high school. And I remember I went to a portfolio day at uh, MCAD. So it is the Minneapolis Center of oh, College art of Art and Design. Design. Yeah. College of Art and Design, yeah. So I took uh, my artwork there as a senior for portfolio day because I was looking at going to that school. And one of the professors, I brought a sculpture of a dog that I did. Mm -hmm. looking at like old Greek, a picture of a Greek statue mm -hmm. of a dog. And from that 2D image, I created the 3D sculpture just using, I guess, guessing or whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> clues or other images for reference. And uh, he was like, 
I really think you need to do more 3D artwork. And he's like, I think you should go do sculpture. Mm. And do sculpture. Like you have an eye for like seeing things in a 3D, three-dimensional space. And so he gave me a really good like little critique of my piece. And he was like, I would actually buy this if you wanted to sell it right now. Whoa. Like, what? <laughs> so I was like shocked. Did you sell your piece? I didn't. I didn't sell it. <laughs> I didn't sell it because I was like, this is like my, the best thing I've ever made out of clay. And I yeah. still have it. Oh. And like, yeah. And he's like, this is great. And so I was like, I had never thought of myself as like a 3D artist. I hadn't mm. done a whole lot with that. So in college, when I couldn't take painting, I was like, maybe I'll just like take a ceramics class. Mm -hmm. And I did. And then I was like, oh, okay. I'm going to major in this. <laughs> so, um, and then painting. I still, I still painted and did mm -hmm. drawing and stuff. I was like, yeah, I sh should be uh, doing ceramic stuff. And mm -hmm. um, so that's why I majored in that. So can you tell us and describe, maybe describe the, I would say like the visual themes of your artwork, what, regardless of media, like what are the, what are the imagery? What is the imagery that you use a lot in your work? or that comes up frequently. Keep in mind, I don't know what any of it means, but I, That's, I didn't ask for, I just wanted okay. you to tell us what you, <laughs> what the imagery is. You don't have to tell us what it means. Okay. You can just I, tell us what, what repeats, what keeps coming. Okay. Repeats, uh, um, ears on stuff. I love putting like animal ears on stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, teeth. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of like, um, oh, I grew up watching a lot of, uh, nature documentaries and like I can't Marty Stouffer's like great escapes or whatever <laughs> and like so I was always into like predators chasing prey and like mm. I loved this weird and I don't want to say this weird almost like violent nature to it and I don't know what drew me about that my mom thought I needed therapy <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> As a kid, there's a lot of blood and a lot of things dying mm -hmm. and like teeth and claws. And, um, but then I also love rabbit imagery mm -hmm. from a, another movie. I watched Watership Down mm -hmm. movie drop that name. Cause I love it, but it is also violent and things die. And so like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's almost like a weird trauma thing as a kid mm -hmm. and like, to to make uh, my mom not sound like a bad mom she didn't know what it was about sure <laughs> and we were watching it when she was not there yeah <laughs> so <laughs> she was very upset when she found out what this movie was about anyway so I got back <laughs> to like that's happened to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and then of course it was all of our favorite movie and she's like I that's my biggest regret mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But so anyway, so I was like drawn to this idea of like fighting or violence and then ears and like the teeth and like, but then as I got older, it kind of, it faded. Um, and then when I was in college, I guess like high school, high school was like very colorful. I did a lot of colorful artwork, mm. um, whimsical, like fantasy. And then college I was kind of just like playing around with all of that I really liked drawing for a while I like drawing these weird dragons with like the teeth and claws but they were colorful and not violent mm. and so I combined like the color and then a lot of I love drawing animals so a lot of animals mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden <laughs> I don't know where it came from there was no color then like mm. then there was then I just hated everything I did with all that color so just black white maybe a pop of like red mm -hmm. um I thought it was really striking but the themes in my art so let me get back to what we were the question so then I started putting a lot of like rabbit ears on things so I would do these like people they were they're like anthropomorphic figures that I think the ideas are inspired by like I'm trying to think of the right words like different tribes I would learn about like different cultures mm -hmm. not pulling from one in itself but almost making my own mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah <laughs> and then so like these human figures have like 
ears, like rabbit ears or like sheep ears, maybe a tail or something, but I wasn't really so much of tails. And now that I think about it, the ears are the only thing that make them like animalistic. <laughs> Everything huh. else, human. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Well, and I would say- <laughs> now that, that, Because now I'm thinking about it. Now yeah. I'm talking about it because I don't, maybe I just thought that they needed something, but- yeah. But then, oh, another theme, now that I think about it, is halos. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up really religious, um, went to a Catholic school, went to church two times a week, and all the imagery there, like, um, which also I think is why I love sculpting hands. There's a lot of, like, hand, I don't know, movements Mm -hmm. in, like, religious sculptures. There's always something done with hands. Yeah. And so I was like... And before third grade, I couldn't see anything because I was super nearsighted. And I didn't even know the sculptures in church, like, unless I got really close. But if they're farther away, I didn't know they had hands. Oh, my gosh. Their fingers. (laughs) (laughs) Then I had glasses and I was like, I can see their hands. And so then, like, I could see their fingers and, like, how they're, like, moved around. And Mm -hmm. and so then I love that. And then the halos, they would have, like, these big, shiny, gold halos coming out and I thought that was just the most beautiful thing Mm. I just wanted to do it on everything yeah (laughs) but yeah and your work too I always think of your work it relates to me like fables and folklore Mm -hmm. and the but it does feel like it's your own story that you're telling like even in my desk area here I have this drawing with two wolves and a figure in the sky flying, pulling a moon. And it says, I am taking what you love. Mm, yeah. And it's so, I mean, it's just, I love it. I forgot love about it. that. It's a great piece. I but, did that. Yeah, I did just like a few of those. Yeah. And it just, I love, there is such a story. And there is such a story. And there's also this connection to, I think like, sort of like human desire, human pain, maybe too, Mm -hmm. in some of the work. And that, that is, um, that's interesting when you put it in the context, even of like church and religion and growing up in a religious setting where there, some churches really do focus on like human pain and suffering. Yeah. And if that's the messages that you've had for a long time, then that it's interesting to see you exploring it, but through your own imagery. I have never thought of that, (laughs) which makes sense though. And speaking of like pain and storytelling. So like my mom tells a lot of stories and Mm -hmm. not even like made up stories, just Mm -hmm. stories from like the past and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. but they're always, she's always very animated talking about it. And Mm -hmm. so my sisters and I, we always tell stories Mm -hmm. like, everything we relate to there's a story Mm -hmm. then we've got to tell somebody (laughs) and and so people will even say like I've Hannah and I my sister Hannah and I have because we're more chatty we've gotten like oh here's one of the stories and I was like what (laughs) and they're like oh yeah I bet Hannah's got a story for that and I was like oh yeah yeah she probably does but but we've always like, and my mom would read us books. And so a lot of uh, my inspiration and stuff would come from um, books, storytelling, movies, like the, I guess the progression of a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And I remember having like storytellers come to our school as kids Mm -hmm. and they had music accompanied with it, but then they would just like with their bodies and their voices tell the story Mm-hmm. And I was like, so engaged in it. I love that. Mm-hmm. And I guess I just wanted to do it myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just, and I knew how to draw. So I was like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm going back. I want to go back to something you said earlier. You were talking about when you were an undergrad and how early or in the first part of your undergrad, you were just playing, exploring, making things, but not being totally attached or understanding them. But in your last, like just before your thesis show, that's when you finally hit on work that you felt like this is the work I want to make. 
So can mm-hmm. you tell us about what that work is? And also, can you tell us about what that moment or that experience of knowing looked like, felt like, like, how did you, how did you know? Can you talk about that? Oh, okay. So let me just think a second here where I want to start. This is start- <laughs> I don't, with- so I'm trying to start without going back too far. Started with a Halloween costume. Um, and I put like us, my uncle at the time owned a mink ranch. Okay. So my mom helped out there. Here's a story. If you want to <laughs> <laughs> hear one or not, she helped out at the mink ranch. She had access to animal parts and I was always kind of interested in biology and collecting rocks and things. And, and I was like, cool like I want to put a skull on like a necklace and wear it out for like Halloween and whatever so she got me like random little mink parts and she cleaned the skulls for me and stuff which was really nice and shipped them to me in the mail and so I had this little box of like mink skulls and teeth and like vertebrae tails and whatever and use that on like a necklace for Halloween and I still had that when I was making so ceramics class I started making these sculptures they didn't have legs or anything and they were kind of like a weird blob it was like hollow in the middle and it was um they didn't have legs it was just hollow you could like almost like a ceramic puppet okay <laughs> if you can imagine that but they had <laughs> arms and a head and shoulders sure um and then the part below that I would carve like a story on Mm. so like they had a head and shoulders and arms and they were expressive and like in different positions and so I made like a woman and a man and these two little wolves and the man and woman were like a king and a queen and then there's like a old grody witch and then so then this is where I kind of found out what I wanted to do more with sculpture wise Mm -hmm. and so I had these sculptures and a lot of my classmates would come and like we would move them around and depending on where you moved them uh the story changed Mm. so like and their facial expressions too I mean of course they stayed the same because it's clay but you know somebody was like well what if like the witch used to be this gorgeous woman and was sisters with the queen and um she was supposed to marry the king and instead the sister married him and she went in the woods became an old gross witch put a curse on their children and now they're little wolves and so like and then people would move them around and create these different like dialogues with it and stories and I thought that was so fun Mm -hmm. and then and then I made a piece for I was going to enter a piece in a show in New Mexico or Arizona or something and it had to be like Southwest inspired so I just made a little sculpture well not little but a sculpture of a person and it had legs and it was kneeling and it had different carvings on it and stuff and I put like a a necklace on it with like a bone around its neck or something Mm -hmm. and I was like this is awesome Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like I love this and then a, a different sculpture on the same time I did of like, I took the wolf idea and I just made it taller and I didn't sculpt any, or I didn't carve any, am I thinking of, I didn't carve anything on it, mm-hmm. right? And it was just all black, but I used like guinea hen feathers I collected from my grandpa's place. And I used this skull from my Halloween necklace and I glued it on its chest. And I was like, that's going badass. And like, <laughs> but like, and I just kept adding stuff to it. And it was like right before critique. And I was like, cause I wasn't going to have anything attached. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to glue these on there. And it, cause it looks cool. And, and then I was like, I love that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. So then I started giving them legs. Long story short, I just, that's how I figured out what I wanted, mm-hmm. what I wanted to do through that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm just play again playing around being yeah. like what if I did this and even though I don't do that so much anymore I don't put animal parts on it things so much I still 
collect them here and there mm-hmm. just because I like I like the look of my space looking like a biology classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You might like this artist Sharif Bay just did a partnership with one of the Carnegie museums in Pittsburgh and he studied their bird collection oh. and then he made arrangements with their birds with the ID tags and photographed them. And then he was also making other ceramic work in response to their collections, but it was this beautiful partnership of their natural history museum and his research and also his childhood of having grown up in Pittsburgh and gone to the museum throughout his childhood. And I feel like you, I need to send you some links because I think you would connect to this so, so deeply. Like this would be a team project for you. Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) this would be good. Well, I, love that. I want to move a little bit in your kind of story, the story of your art. And after you finished undergrad, can you take us through what your years after that formal training were like in terms of what you did with your time? And then also after that, I want to dig into what you, what you made or didn't make. And then later we'll get to where you are today too. Okay. So was done with college. I lived that's where my college was um, for a couple years after that and I lived with some roommates. I didn't do any art for like two years. I was working at a school and the most art I would do would be little drawings for kids. So I was still drawing, but it wasn't like a project or anything. It was nice to take the break because mm-hmm. uh, I feel like I was like a little burnt out, but <sighs> No, I don't regret, do- I don't regret not doing art during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I moved and it was during that time where I, <laughs> okay, so I developed a depression and anxiety mm-hmm. uh, after I moved away from my college town and away from my friends. And I don't really know how much I can say, I guess, but I was in like a, involved in like a domestic abuse situation Mm -hmm. and from that I became extremely like paranoid and uh yeah like depressed um Mm -hmm. anxious and the house I was living in I just wasn't comfortable in but at the Mm -hmm. same time I had agreed to make artwork for um a hospital show Mm -hmm. like they had oh the Hudson Hospital. The Hudson Hospital. Yeah. They have yeah. The, healing, the healing arts program yep. where they bring in artists to make work for those exhibition, permanent exhibition spaces in the yeah. art, in the hospital. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Healing arts. And I'm over here, like slowly mm. feel like I'm decaying. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the timing of that was, oh yeah. And like the first piece I did, which is one of my absolute favorite pieces was too dark to put in the show. I think I feel like that piece I did to like get it out of my system and it was some of the first actual work I did in a long time mm-hmm. and then the rest from there were a little more like they're like nature nature inspired whimsical kind of also kind of played on the fact that my sister at the time was in this situation as well with me because we were living together mm-hmm. and so I I guess the artwork was inspired from what happened but mm-hmm. in a way you couldn't really tell, I guess. Sure. Um, that was okay to be at a hospital mm-hmm. <laughs> and not, not, not depressing. Right? And it's part of a healing of, arts program. It's a, it's <laughs> probably shouldn't be something strangling itself, right? <laughs> probably, probably, probably not. Probably. So, so it had to be reason, decently okay. <laughs> uh, so I made a couple of these big pieces for, you know, drawing pieces out of ink for that Mm -hmm. and I was like okay like these all turned out really well and uh got out of that space moved to a much happier place and when it was in a better mind space got a another job after that a better job with you and (laughs) (laughs) yes you came to our house and started being a nanny for our children when our youngest was just over one years old and Mm -hmm. yeah that was an amazing time that was that was such and that actually is what so that turned everything around Mm. um so getting in this new space a new house and being just in a happier place in my life and being surrounded by art at your place and like discussing art Mm -hmm. um I started making more 
around that time, like that transition time, I did make some like ceramic sculptures Mm -hmm. uh, for a show. And then, but that was the last time I really made any ceramic sculptures that were similar to my college artwork. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I mostly did drawing and painting. And then also at the time at your place, I would do sketches like for sculpture ideas. Mm -hmm. And from that, I just thought, well, why the hell am I like just doing these little sketches for my sculptures when I can just do the sketches as drawings themselves Mm -hmm. and not worry about sculpture and Mm -hmm. just focus on that. So then that's how these like weird little people with ears and stuff Mm -hmm. came to be. And I just kind of really attached that idea and then took off and and I'm trying to think I haven't done though and I knew it wasn't going to last a long time I knew it wasn't going to be a forever phase of my art yeah but I felt very grounded in what I was doing and like that I should be doing that Mm -hmm. Um, but right now I'm in a spot where I'm a little bit sad because I don't have the want to do those anymore Mm -hmm. so now I don't know what I'm gonna do Mm -hmm. so yeah so it caught me at a fun time (laughs) I'm really glad. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that is great. that is yeah, and I'm glad we're at this point in the conversation though too. Is you know you mentioned that after undergrad you took two years of not making, and that was a break. Like that that was after having worked really focused on your work for five five and a half years, yeah. then to take two years to just process that time or unwind from that time. That's a whole that is there, but now you're at a different kind of break. It sounds like you're at a break of, of not knowing. And so when this is the question I'm always curious about with people is when did you notice when or how did you notice that you weren't making anything anymore? You mean recently or back recently? Let's just go recently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me think before I was, okay, I was making stuff before I moved. Um, I haven't been making since I moved. I think just like the stress of it all, uh, Mm -hmm. of moving across the country and Mm -hmm. starting a job. And the job I have is great. Like I get to teach art and I make examples. So I do make art. I did do a ceramic sculpture because I had, I have the kiln and, you know, where Mm -hmm. I work and the clay and, but it was more for like, my job right it was it wasn't for me so much I haven't really done anything at home I'm trying so I forgot your question <laughs> oh just trying to just trying to pay when I when it when or how you know okay. like yeah when when do you notice or how do you how did you notice like oh I haven't like this is the way my head kind of tells this story like oh I haven't made anything for myself and my own creative ideas in a while and okay. And I'm just wondering, like, when does that point happen for you? Like, is there something specific that you're like, is it someone asking you like, oh, have you been making anything? And then that triggers like, oh, I haven't been making anything. Or you're like, how does that, how does that awareness come into being for you? Okay. Okay. Now, okay. Now I know. Um, It just clarified for me. Okay. Yeah. So I was uh, at work and my job told me that I can go like because so like there's a studio in the resort Mm -hmm. it's attached to the main hallway and I like manage the studio and teach classes out of there and I make the classes and whatnot so they also said to draw people in or get people talking about art or getting them interested in possibly taking classes you can you can go to different areas in the resort and I'm told that I can go around to different areas of the resort and do artwork and draw people in and get them asking questions, all that. So I did that while there was some live music in one of the main rooms, um, like folksy music. And there's people in there listening. And I went in there and just painted like watercolor painting. And and it's fun because I love when people come and ask questions and talk. Mm -hmm. But it was then because people were asking me what I was doing. And I was like, oh. Like they asked me to describe what I was painting and it was something similar to what I used to do. Mm-hmm. And I realized that was the first thing I made in a long time. That was like what I actually wanted to do. Uh, it wasn't an, an example for a class or mm-hmm. um, I was using the colors I wanted. I wasn't thinking about 
if people would think it's weird or if they were because I was like this is just for me like this is for Mm -hmm. me to keep it's not going to be displayed it's not going to be you know Mm -hmm. an example that you have to teach from yeah yeah and I really don't like it but like (laughs) I don't like how it turned out but that's fine Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so then I that was it and it was maybe like it was October. So it really hasn't been that long, but that was the last thing I made for myself. And I've been meaning to sit down during this break to do it, but I just haven't. Yeah. And that's something else I ask people too, is what stops you from creating? I don't have an idea. And that's one of the, probably one of the first times that that's happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know a lot of people have issues with ideas, Mm -hmm. um, but that was never a problem for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I always like could just start doing lines and do something and it would be like something I thought was cool and that I liked but now like I try also talking about the style that I had with those like anthropomorphic people and sketches I was doing like I'm not I don't feel the need to do those anymore or Mm -hmm. I don't want to do them anymore Mm -hmm. and so I feel like now I have nowhere else to go or like you need else. new vocab new visual vocabulary yes I need yeah. a new inspiration or something new to expand on and I I've been doing more like realistic sketches out mm-hmm. of like with like ink and stuff so but they're not to me they're not like really exciting they're just mm-hmm. it's like a picture of a horse mm-hmm. or a picture of like they're really they're well done and they're gorgeous and they people love it Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I don't want to sit down and do that all the time. It's not like tapping into your creative source, your creative well skill. Yeah. Yeah. Skill. Oh, okay. Yes. So this is a little bit of a like tangent, but you talked about skill in the beginning too, in your childhood, in the classes, and that you felt like your sisters had skill and like they could, like anyone could build their skill. And so Could you talk a little bit about like, cause you've just identified what skill is to you in your own work, but could you, could you pull that apart a little bit more for people? Like when you say like you can have skill versus when you're using your artistic thinking or like thought process, like, could you tell us a little more about those differences for you? So the differences for me, so I mean, so how I think of it is I gain skill through doing artistic things I wanted but Mm -hmm. then the skill some of the skill came into part um like in college like little things like not so much physically how to do it like on paper or anything but like how you think about things so like Mm -hmm. something I repeat all the time to like classes I have now is like light source Mm. Like that's something that made a huge impact on me. Like Mm -hmm. where's the light coming from? How is it hitting an object? Where Mm -hmm. are the shadows? How is it shaped? And like that totally like sunk into my brain. Mm. And so, and I talk about that to other people now. So that to me is a skill thing, like Mm -hmm. something you, and then it's information I gathered and then use it in my art, which creativity the creative aspect is also like that now that I say that but because I'm taking information from other things and using it create creatively in my work but it's not they're two separate things now that I'm thinking about it so like Mm -hmm. like how do you shadow how to use like different values and how to mix color and like that to me is like skill technical skill technical skill yeah yeah and then I guess just how I think about it is the artistic part, Mm -hmm. but so, yeah, so I, so I feel like when I do technical skill drawings, like something more realistic, people love it Mm -hmm. because they can connect with it and they understand it. Yeah. And they're like, wow, like you're really good. And I'm like, thanks. I just kind of looked at a picture and I just used what I've taught, you know? Yeah. And but you then practice. I practice. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, and as a kid, I would draw all the every day. Mm-hmm. And like, and when I mean kid, I mean like even up through high school. So like mm-hmm. all the time. So, and I'd constantly be learned trying to teach myself how to do new skills. Mm-hmm. So like how to draw books, 
I would save up my money, like babysitting money uh-huh. and buy drawing books from Michael's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like differences in male and female face shapes and structure. And so like I was reading those as like a 16 year old and like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I had no idea. <laughs> so, but so that, so that I think I see as like learn learned skill or things you yeah. learn that you put into practice. I feel like I kind of strayed from what the question. No, that's good. It just, I think it's, it's helpful to clarify to people listening that creativity often when people say I'm not creative or I'm not artistic, they're talking actually about skill. Like I don't have the skill to do that. It's not actually that they aren't capable of creative thinking or artistic thinking but that in their mind, they don't have the skill to make the thing they they're thinking about or seeing. Exactly. And it's actually the skill that that's lacking in it. And I wonder sometimes how much just that thought alone stops people from even taking the risk to learn how to draw or how to do mm-hmm. something because they just tell themselves that they can't, or they're not, they're not capable of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll, tell people all the time like like I said I get people in my classes and they're like I can't draw and I'm like well you could if you practiced and Mm you or you had the drive to practice Mm -hmm. or the 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 interest to pursue it Mm -hmm. I mean I could I feel like I could be really good at I don't know I'm trying to think biomechanics or whatever if that's even a real thing like I've, <laughs> I could do that if I wanted if I had the interest and mm-hmm. like the drive to study it and mm-hmm. I just don't I don't really care yeah <laughs> and if that. you make I, and if you make space for it in your life yeah yeah, yeah absolutely so okay I have a question for you because just before we we took this little tangent you were talking about inspiration and that right now maybe like you don't have the inspiration for what your next round of imagery is going to be in your work or your next thing you're going to explore. And I'm curious if you can tell us about, or if you could just tell us about how do you, what are some ways that you've come upon inspiration in your life? So you shared about like the animal skulls that your mom was able to bring you at one point and how those became inspiration from your costume to more work, but what other ways have, has inspiration come to you in your life? And maybe in more recent time. Well, I'm going to think for a second on that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, where have I been finding inspiration as a, um, I don't know if that's like why I'm not making art too, is because I just haven't felt like I've found mm-hmm. a lot of inspiration lately. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, recently I've been liking to get, get buy clothes that have, more fun illustrative prints and like that I feel like kind of inspires like right now I'm wearing unicorn pants (laughs) and like (laughs) like, they're pajama pants but like they have unicorns on and different foliage and I'm like oh man like I could do something like that Mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't mean I'm going to anytime soon (laughs) (laughs) but I could if I felt like it Mm -hmm. so I guess like maybe I just collect these little random things I like in hopes that they'll speak to me somehow. And if I surround myself with it, Mm -hmm. it'll help me. Mm -hmm. I also think right now it's hard though, because starting a new job and Mm -hmm. going through all that, especially when I have to think about things I'd rather not think about, like Mm -hmm. expense reports and budgets and um, I think is the worst thing I could possibly ever think about <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> in terms of how it fun. pull and how it pulls away from energy that could be put towards creativity. It yeah. It oh, let's and, talk. Can we talk a little more about that? Because I think that happens yeah. to people quite a bit in their life. Like there's just times where you have to just do these other things and they take energy and then yeah. What makes creativity and maybe, maybe this is the better follow-up question. What makes creativity flow for you and come alive for you in your life? So like if, if, if paperwork and budget and expense reports takes creativity away from your life, what actually gives 
to your creativity? What? Another create other creative people. I think uh, speaking um, and being around other creative people helps. I know I was always, it was always hard for me to make art just on my own. And f- like, when I mean on my own, like in my own head, thinking about it myself, not talking to anybody else about it. It was mm-hmm. so hard. Like I just, cause it could just stay in my brain. Yeah. I didn't have to express it here now. I think so when, when you, so I almost started crying when you were talking about what makes me feel most creative or like, feel like I want to mm-hmm. probably when I have no worries about anything, which mm. never happens. <laughs> I also do take commissions though, off and on. So that as much as sometimes I don't like commissions, they are a godsend because they keep me making Mm -hmm. um, and practicing. Mm -hmm. So that is what I also kind of have been doing. And also it's like a, a, what is it? Like an assignment. (laughs) Yeah. Those external deadlines can be very motivating and maybe sometimes when we become creatively uninspired or stuck, having that external deadline forces you to keep going, even when you just kind of want to not do any yeah. of it. Because somebody's holding you accountable. Like yeah. they're waiting. <laughs> yeah. And they're asking you about it. And yeah. I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, well, I'm almost done with it. And then I'm looking at it and I got like one line on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'll send you a picture soon. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I got to sit down tonight. (laughs) So like, that's nice (laughs) that I have that. I'm trying to think the last time I really felt, I guess like when I did that one piece for myself, there was music playing. It was music I enjoyed. I was with a good friend. People were talking about art with me and that, Mm -hmm. you know, we were just having good discussions on it and I felt like really into it. Mm -hmm. So, which is also why in college, I like probably didn't want to leave the studio just mm-hmm. because I liked having those conversations, even if they weren't necessarily art-based conversations, yeah. just with other similar minded creative people mm-hmm. and was a huge help because what- right now I work with uh, um, people that work with numbers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's such a big difference. It's a different conversation. It is. And I'm just like, we are not on the same level, mm-hmm. but which is fine. But anyway, mm-hmm. you asked your question. No, you did. And it, it's reminding me that, you know, what you said about being in the studio with other people, what it reminds me of is the idea of being around people who are engaged in life and engaged in, um, inquiry. Mm-hmm. And a lot of creatives are actively engaged in questioning or wondering, or just interested. You talked about early on being really interested in drawing or interested in certain things. And when we have that strong pull of interest, that does get us, uh, gets our mind engaged and moving. And when we do that, it feels like it helps us access creative spaces more easily and thinking about, you know, how, what other ways can you engage a create in, in a creative community, but maybe even just a community that's engaged in their inquiry of their surroundings or something like just getting people in those conversations about the things they're curious about. I always feel like that's an inspiring place to be too. A hundred percent. That's you like nailed it. Oh, like I've talked to people and we're, where we can just play off of each other's like comments and like building and expanding in like an imaginative setting or space, like Like I'll say like, well, what if it could be even something like my favorite thing to talk about with people is what if humans shed their skin, like an insect sheds their exoskeleton. Right. And then just thinking of everything surrounding that topic and how life would be changed. And, and I'm just like, oh my God, it needs to be a book or something. But, but so then I would talk to people about that. And I, sometimes I bring it up to kind of like gauge where people are at in terms of (laughs) like a litmus test of like, yeah. are we going to be able to have an interesting conversation or are, not? Am I going to like talking to you or am I not? <laughs> I'm like, what do you think if people shed their skin, like insects shed their exoskeleton? And if they were like, that's really interesting. Um, I think it would be like this. And I'd be like, sweet. 
now we're in it <laughs> or like or if they're like that's gross and, and like, like horrified yeah and I'm like you are not exciting <laughs> <laughs> which is horrible because I think it was at one of your at your hammock your, your oh hammock the installation and yeah and I think I brought up something like that and Ann Lawton was like here we go <laughs> she's like I figured you were gonna say something like this when you were here and I was like, <laughs> it was so funny but uh anyway so the, I and I don't do that with every person obviously but right but yeah people that are open to like questioning and different ideas or thoughts or thought processes or anything mm-hmm. is super inspiring I mean because mm-hmm. then you take away you can take away because from things they've said because knowing that if they're also creative, they're probably going to say something interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. And and if they're not, then you're just like, well, I don't know. That person's not for me. Next person. But mm-hmm. I'm just rambling now. But No, but it's good. I mean, I think that's who we, it, what you're getting at is who we surround ourselves with definitely can, definitely impacts what we think about and what we're, yeah. what we're engaged in and what we're looking to and what we're, and maybe that's a really good strategy for when we're feeling stuck or uninspired is to take a moment to look and pause. Like, what are we filling ourselves with? What are we filling our spaces with? Who are we filling our time with and asking what, what's maybe missing out of that? That's exactly. I feel like, um, you keep all of our thoughts right now so contained and neat and I'm just like like just throwing <laughs> things out there and then you like bring it back in I'm like wow she is so good at this <laughs> like, right now, I'm like she just took what I was meaning to say from like probably like a 10 minute tangent <laughs> no you told the story and I gave you the moral okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> that's what we did Okay, we work good. together. Okay, good. <laughs> this is a really good spot to talk about spaces you make in or spaces you've made in. So what I'm interested in hearing from you is what does your current, I know you have a studio space at work because you teach in it, but do you have a space in your living space that you also make? And by space, I'm using that word really broadly, meaning like, is it your lap? Is it your, a table in your kitchen? Like, where are the spaces that you make? Is it in a sketchbook that you take with you places? And if you could just talk about the spaces that you make in. So the house I live in right now, which I gave you a little tour earlier, kind of. Mm -hmm. Uh, The couch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The space I make is the couch right now. Yeah. Uh, Like sketchbook on my lab and my little bag of pens next to me. I do have a drawing table. It's in storage. I love using that thing. And so I wish it was here, but there's not enough space. So the couch works. It's Mm -hmm. not, it's hard though, because I think I need a space to go to. Mm. Like I need a space to sit down at that is dedicated for that. Yeah. Um, Which is why that table, like I really loved going up there and just being like, okay, like here's all my supplies right here, like in a little organized, you know, pen thing. And I can tilt the table if I wanted to. And it was great. And I felt, I was like, I feel like a real artist, like coming back to what we were talking about, like Mm -hmm. using professional like tools and stuff. So I was like, like, this is it. Like I'm going to make something good. Whereas sitting on the couch, I'm like, oh, can like scribble around or I can just like space out and turn on Netflix and not do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So having a space that's dedicated for art is super important. I haven't created that here yet because I do have the studio at work. And if I did want to make something I could granted, it's not really what I want to make. Yeah. Yeah. So right now my lap, (laughs) your lap and your bed, I think this is important. Your bag of your bag of drawing materials, your pens. Yes. Just, it can be something so small. I was talking with someone else and we were talking about just having like a basket of supplies. It, it, oh, I know what it was. It was a guest on another podcast called this Jen, the spectacle. And I just said, like, I think like having a basket of supplies that you can move around with you wherever is a really quick, easy way to have a creative 
like have creative access because it's not like, oh, I got to go dig them out. Oh, I got to find that paper. Oh, because those are all the things I tell myself when things aren't easy. And so if mm. you put it all in a basket, it's really easy. It's like, well, all I do is grab this basket and there's my yep. things. I have an embroidery basket for it, which is kind of an old lady thing to have. Like, remember my great grandmother, I think it was, had her like crochet basket next to her chair. And so it was always like, there's her crochet basket. And maybe that's where <laughs> like that came from. So I have like the embroidery basket and then I Cute. easily do baskets with supplies when I need to move from place to place in our house. But that's just an easy way. And so like you have your bag of pens, like a bag <laughs> of pens is a really quick, like grab that bag and it's got what you need. It just mm-hmm. gets you started. Exactly. And it's, and I, so now that you talk about that, I realize I heavily rely on that bag of pens. Mm. Mm. Like if I can't, if I feel like I want to do something and I can't find, if I can't find that bag of pens, I am like, oh my God. I'm like, what am I going to do? Yeah. I'm like, I can't, even though I could easily probably just doodle a little bit with like a regular pen, which is absolutely what I've done at your house yeah. with the kids. Um, and I've made some things I love with mm-hmm. a big pen. but like here I'm like I have that bag of pens you know like I don't really misplace it a lot but mm-hmm. there's been times that I'm like I need it like yeah. I, I, like everything's in it yeah <laughs> I can't just go buy everything again and I now that I think about it like yeah having it around is has like a sense of comfort knowing like if I wanted to I could open it up and mm-hmm. um, what I need's in there mm-hmm or just having it around. It's like, oh yeah, I draw sometimes. Mm-hmm. I draw sometimes. <laughs> That's something I do. It's something I just, a weird little quirk, you know? <laughs> the lady who draws. I'm not like other ladies. Here are like the birds. It. Get your birds out. Get drawing your birds. Oh, oh right. <laughs> <laughs> Start drawing cardinals. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. So that is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's all I got right now. No, that's, that's great. I just think it's, I, it's good to let people know the different places that people make, because sometimes I think it's really easy to tell ourselves that we'll make when we have this space, we will make something when we have this and we can, we can Mm -hmm. do it before then too. Yes. Oh, you absolutely can. Uh, there's a shoot. There was a ceramic artist I became friends with on Facebook a while back, and I can't remember his name now. He teaches somewhere south. He's a professor, a ceramic professor. But briefly chatted online about making, and he was like, "Well, if you really, you can make wherever." Well, you mm-hmm. can make wherever. And I was like, oh. I was like, I know. And I was like <laughs> younger and whiny. And I was like, he's like, I've made, you know, I've done ceramics and apartments. And I'm just like, that's a lot of work. And like, <laughs> it's not easily set up and like, it's not there. And he's like, says, but he's like, okay, he has a point. Like if you really want to, you could do it wherever. But sometimes I think I'm just okay with saying like I don't want to yeah and I used to kind of beat myself up over not making regularly like so when I talked about not making anything after college Mm -hmm. I was upset that I wasn't making anything that I thought was like good work or anything but thinking when I think about it now I'm not I don't feel bad that I didn't do anything Mm -hmm. so I think the break was nice and I think right now I'm just essentially taking a break Mm-hmm. trying to separate separate work art from my own art and finding a space in between those to like feel like I want to make my own art again mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I'm explaining it right but no you are I that's a I think that's a transition that we don't talk about a lot is when you have a job that requires some part of your artistic self show up that you have to you, some people I think wholly integrate, can fully integrate and bring all of their creative art self into the work, into the teaching or to whatever element it is in the professional work. But then I also think there's this step of 
separating it and realizing and acknowledging that it's different, that the work you make, the artwork that you make for work is different than the artwork that you make for your own creative practice. Yes. I'm glad, I'm glad you're making that a specific difference in Um, in articulating it for us. yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think just like having friends that would have like professional lives in the arts and like just hearing about people trying to separate that I came into it knowing I would have to yeah um otherwise I know I would probably never do anything again at home while I do teach art classes there's also an aspect of uh entertaining Mm -hmm. so I'm also like using energy to entertain and make sure people are having fun having a good time it's not just about learning about art because these people are on vacation and they don't really want to be educated so much as have an experience. Mm -hmm. So while I do use my art skills at my job, I'm also trying to sneak in education Yeah, (laughs) through making things come off as fun and like, it's no big deal if you mess up, like, it's fine. It's cool. What you're making is great. And And then trying to get them to walk away with something that they're proud of on top of it. Yeah. So, which is, which is nice in in a way because I don't do so much art then where I feel burnt out. Yeah. I think it's just mostly my social interaction. Yeah. After a while that makes me feel burnt out. Yeah. Which, which I'm also glad for. So I'm not making so much art, but I'm glad because I think it's like hibernating right now. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone, despite the title of the podcast, I don't think anyone's <laughs> artist is actually dead no. inside. I think we just, we might feel no. that, but the reality is it's always there. It's just untapped. It's, un, it's just hibernating at times. It's just not acknowledged, not seen. Yeah. I never mm-hmm. think it's actually dead. No. Which I, I figured you didn't think that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so it, right now, my our, our creativity is definitely hibernating. Mm. Um, for a bit, for waiting for a better time to probably come out. Oh, this transitions us so nicely into, so the end of the episode here, what I like to do is called studio time wrap up. And I have a series of four, um, prompts slash questions. And what you've said really will, I think you might repeat yourself, which is totally fine. The first one is a finish this sentence. When I don't know what to create or make, I... Doodle. (laughs) <laughs> I'll just draw lines on paper and it eventually turns into something <laughs> and then maybe and then through that I either find a new like style of things I like or a new way to draw something or I essentially just force myself to put something on a, on paper anyway and usually I I don't keep sketchbooks so much because I want things I make to be on good paper because more times than not, I've made things that I wish was on better paper. Mm. So now I just draw on nice paper Mm. uh, because I'll like it. I usually like it regardless. But if I don't know what to make at all, I will not go on good paper. It will be like a Mm post-it or something and I'll just draw a little whatever. And then I'm like, okay, and that fulfills whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Very it. vague. No, but. that's perfect. That's wonderful, actually. And and by going on that post-it, you've just taken out any, you kind of remove, what you do is you remove expectations because it's just a post-it. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of takes away, like it has to be anything more than just a doodle on a post-it. Yeah. And, if, yeah. and there have been times where I've done things on a post-it and I'm like, dang it. <laughs> it's really on a nice post. little drawing <laughs> so then you know of course then though then but then um to make it seem bigger than what it is or better than what it is 
in my <laughs> mind. I take a picture of it, right? And then I put it on Instagram. And instead of, and then I put like a black and white filter on it. So it doesn't look like a yellow post. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, this is really good. And I'm like, yeah. On a, it's on an F and post it. That's why. On a F and post it. <laughs> I did it at work at my clinic job <laughs> between my two minute break of whatever, like, you know, yeah. but I'm like, this makes me feel better that it's, it's like, it's, it, it's in like a technology, ske- technological sketchbook, like on my phone. Yeah. Like, almost like a, I don't know, like a weird journal. Yeah. So totally. it goes in that makes me feel better but but if I don't like the drawing on the post-it it can just get thrown away yeah and then it's gone yeah yep okay this next one I asked you to share five songs that you could listen to on repeat in your studio repeat in your studio or anytime so these are the songs I'm going to list them okay Alaska by Kai Ola San Louis by Gregory Allen Isakoff or Isakoff we were trying to decide that mm-hmm. earlier Menswear by the 1975, Running Away by Vano 3000, Bodies by the Knox and Muna. Mm-hmm. And so I would like to know if you could share how these songs contribute to your creative flow. Ooh, ooh. Some of those are very different. Um, so I'm going to clump. So Vano... Uh, Running Away by Vano 3000 and Bodies by Muna and the Knox, that those are in their own little category. They're a little more like electronic, I think, or like kind of dancey, but like calm. So I the music, I feel like makes my mind like float in this like headspace above myself. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, it just lifts you to like a higher space in your thoughts. And like, so when I'm in the studio and I'm making things or I'm throwing on a wheel or which isn't my favorite, but <laughs> I just feel like it's lighter. It's like, yeah. I, I also feel like a cool girl when I listen to it. <laughs> I love it. This is me in the studio making, and I feel cool. Oh, that makes sense. It totally does. I love it though. So like, it's like kind of dancey and fun, but I'm just like, it's a little funky. But like, uh, the bodies song by the Knox is like, I don't know, flowy. So yeah. so that helps with things. Um, and then Kyola and um, San Louis, those songs. They're very grounding songs, I feel. Mm. Um, They are a little bit more sad, not high energy, but they, I feel very like into what I'm doing when I'm listening Mm. to them. Yeah. I think the voices and the type of music and the, you know, the overall mood of it kind of sucks me in. So like almost opposite. So like those two songs in the beginning, like by Kyola and Gregory Allen put me like onto the page more so and where like the other song is like float above it I don't know <laughs> I love the way you're describing it. I wish people could see your hand gestures oh. too because <laughs> you're bringing your hands into each other and going down, down. into like your core and yeah. then the others kind of bring you up above in this expansive of yeah mm-hmm. yeah oh and then the menswear song I think has so it's funny that I put that also in the middle because when I in the middle of the list because I think it's funny because I think feel like there's aspects of both of those in that song. Mm. So the beginning is like floaty above your head feeling. And then as the very end where there's words, it's still upbeat, but grounds you to an extent. Mm. So it's, you're not as high above where you were before. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> no, I love, okay. I love people's responses to this question. It's been so fun to hear the way we're thinking about it and impacted. Well, so it's, my, it's funny because I wish uh, I can't wait to hear what everybody else says about theirs. <laughs> yeah, and then when you hear the mix yourself, you're you're like, oh, like it might do that for you, or it might not do that for you too, which is yeah. fun. Okay, next question: 
what brings you joy in your creative life? Um, Oh, and I've listened to podcasts talking about joy and I'm like, yeah, I have that. <laughs> and now you ask me the question and I'm like, what, what is, what, what do I have? Um, I know I have joy. joy. Yeah. What brings you joy in your creative life? I like, I like l- looking at outdoor spaces I like being outside a lot I also like imagining grandiose things like if I were to look outside right now I'm just looking at trees and stuff like just imagine if like you had this giant cool web that expanded like this whole side of like the forest by my house Mm -hmm. maybe not even with colors but like little shiny string I don't know like just imagining anything in any space Mm. it's mostly outside because there's there's like big sky and like trees or foliage or whatever like you could incorporate any of that with what you're doing Mm -hmm. if this makes sense yeah (laughs) that brings me joy thinking about like these crazy idea not crazy but like big ideas or but I also another thing that's not related really but like talking to kids Mm -hmm. like I love talking to kids about creativity and art and I've gotten some kids in my classes and like their attitude towards it is amazing like they love not all kids like granted some kids are more into sports and they don't want to sit there and do it but like some of the kids I've had they're like I could do this all day and they just have an unlimited amount of ideas Mm. and then so I ask them like what are you thinking of when you do this or and it's the most refreshing thing I guess Mm. to hear and I'm like I need to like take inspiration from that way of thinking Mm -hmm. and apply that to my own artwork like this one girl she was like I'm gonna draw a picture of myself um she's like I'm Irish that's why I have this curly red hair and I was like oh okay and so like she paints this picture of herself and it's like orange just like this big orange hair all over the place and I was like that is like so cute and like that's amazing and that's a gorgeous painting Mm -hmm. and I'm like when have I ever felt like doing a self-portrait and really just like I don't know like focusing on the things that make me me or being proud of it or yeah never yeah <laughs> I've never done that except for that ballerina picture I drew as a kindergartner out of charcoal mm-hmm. and I was like in love with that drawing but I don't think I've ever done I've never done a self-portrait like that since then where I've been mm-hmm. like that's it mm-hmm. you know yeah but so just like learn learning from kids I suppose and talking to them and is really makes me excited about creating, I guess. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. The last, the last one. Finish the sentence. My creativity is. Uh, All over the place. (laughs) It is eclectic or it is. I feel like at times it is like this wild thing that like I'm trying to like tame it or understand it. Mm. Sounds weird. Mm. But it it is not. It cannot be. Like I try to like rein it in, right? And I'm like, okay, like I'm going to make you do what I want when I want. Like I want to make do something. I want to make art right now. And I need you to like calm down or like (laughs) listen and like work for me <laughs> and it's like <laughs> it's like, like yeah maybe <laughs> maybe not <laughs> and I'm like get over here because we're like I'm sitting down to do it right and like that's where I can like do skill because skill I feel like is like inside of me mm. like the skills inside creativity I feel like is is to an extent inside of me but not it's not also mm. so like I feel like I'm constantly like 
searching for creativity outside myself and trying to harness it in mm. and like make it work for me but sometimes I'm just too tired to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> or too tired to deal with it I don't know I don't know I did and I don't think it's not like I think like that every time I sit down to draw or anything right um but now that you're like asking me that's how it feels yeah like the- one second and I don't know if maybe I'm like uh, my my family has ADD or ADHD or whatever. So like, and I've never been tested for it and I'm not on medication if I have it, but I feel like at times it's like over here, I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, and it's over here, like, like creativity is like over there, like feeding off of something or thriving. And I'm like, okay, bring it back. And then it's like, no, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to look at this and I like this. And I'm like, okay, now like, let's bring it back and like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. use it. And it's like, I'm just going to stay with it with, out of arm's reach for now. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> Whenever you come back, that's cool. <laughs> I like though that it feels like it's an active conversation for you. Like it's not just, um, I think Liz Gilbert talks about this in Big Magic in her book about creativity. And, and she talks about fear in that way, like where it, she has, she's in conversation with these elements in her life. And so when you're describing this experience you're having with your own creativity, it feels like you are in conversation with your creative self. And that's, mm-hmm. that's wonderful. Cause I think maybe that's what a lot of people feel like they're not like, they're not in conversation with their own creativity. And that's a practice in of, a, in of, of itself is to be in conversation with your own creativity. I guess I didn't even realize that people weren't, Mm. but that would be hard though to not be, Mm -hmm. but in essence, like it's in reality, I feel like it's not, it's not, it is its own thing, but physically, no, it's not like this thing that you can physically hold and like, be like, you're going to stay here. Mm -hmm. It's just like thoughts in your brain. Mm -hmm. and how you interpret things and whatever and Mm -hmm. but may I think turning it into it's almost it reminds me of um what was it is it Daniel Carissa when she did a workshop I was at oh yeah about your inner critic yes yeah where you like you made personify it that was a thing yes yeah you made it a thing and you like talk to it and you're like no so then I feel like that's how I'm with my creativity where I'm like, you are like way left field and we're just, I'm going to let you do what you want. And I'm going to forget about you mm-hmm. <laughs> for now. <laughs> and maybe like, it'll, you'll come back and be like, yeah, this is cool. I'll be like, okay. <laughs> but like, it hel- I think it helps keep it organized or helps keep it by giving it some, a name or not a name, but like some to see it as something else. Yeah. It gives it Instead form. It you. gives it form. Yeah. 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 Cause if you're like, oh, these are just all these thoughts in my head. I'm like, there's a lot of thoughts in my head. And like, how else do I keep it separate? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> sounds great. It sounds crazy now that I say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. I have a strong okay. feeling you are not alone. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Teresa. This has just been a pleasure and a delight. And I appreciate your reflectiveness about kind of like the whole of the story of your creativity, like where, where it began and being able to see these touchstones that you've identified. I've been, it's been a pleasure to hear today. Well, thank, and thank you for asking me all these questions. These are things I would have probably not thought about otherwise, or, said out loud Mm. because like I said where I'm at is not a I don't have a lot of conversations like this right now Mm -hmm. so this is probably the first time in a while I've discussed anything like this and I actually surprised myself in what I said because I didn't even think of it as I was saying it I just Mm. blurted it everything I said I just I didn't even think of it and just came you let it come you didn't filter like it just no let it come no filter (laughs) (laughs) so 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 I also thank you for like listening and being patient. Cause I feel like at times it was very on, what is it? You couldn't understand it. No, it, but somebody out there probably will. 
Yes. <laughs> and I could definitely follow what you were saying and okay. what you were getting at. Okay. So, yeah. so maybe my hand, so, my hand movements help. Those really help. They're, they're very descriptive in telling the story. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh gosh. Well, yeah. Thank you for asking me them because it definitely is going to make me think more mm. about it, especially since I'm not making right now. So, mm. so yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take inspiration from Teresa this week. Make a bag of art supplies, pens, markers, and paper. Find a comfy spot on a sofa or chair. Sketch a little bird a la Jean from Teresa's early art classes. Or doodle a little pattern of dots. Give yourself some nice paper if you have it. Or use a post-it to take the pressure off. Remember, you can always use a black and white filter on Instagram to jazz it up later. You have a child in your life who loves art? Help them find a community art class to learn more. Or check out a How to Draw Something book from your local library and draw with them. And if you need something a little low-key creative this week, maybe just find a song that makes you feel like a cool girl and joyfully dance along with it. This week, rustle your hibernating creativity a little bit. Welcome it into your day-to-day -day life. You can follow Teresa on Instagram at Teresa Snow, and I happen to know that she's been making some new work, so you'll want to check it out. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, please share it and rate and review wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next week, bye.